welcome everybody to this, um, as you can see, business growth and transfer workshop, or as some people have called it, the word succession. Um, so we're actually going to take the word succession out of our vocabulary today and talk about business growth and transition. So I'm Gordon Stone, I'm one of the speakers. Um, I have a business based in Toowoomba called the Agribusiness Development Institute and I'll explain a little bit more as we go today the sort of role that we're involved in but effectively um, helping people grow and expand their businesses which is going to be the focus that I'll take today. Um, so the reason that we've called this business growth and transition is that we know that there are people who are um, looking at changing their business, uh, whether that be bringing another generation in, whether it's exiting the business or what what the other possibilities are, um, are yet to be determined. So when we were speaking with, with Heather and, and myself and the other speakers here, um, we came up with the notion of let's take a very proactive approach to this whole discussion. Um, so effectively our, our purpose today um, is, to, is to take a very proactive approach rather than being somewhat reactive. And I'm, when, when one, one of my first slides when we get started will be to kind of deal with what we often see, um, which is what I call the train wreck. Um, and so that's where all sorts of emotional fuss and bother occurs. So our objective is to kind of park that idea and take this very orderly approach. And so in our business, our aim is up the top there, which is to create a high performing, self-managing, saleable and profitable business. And so my, what I'm gonna ask you to do is to step away from your business right now, become the dispassionate outsider looking in and ask yourself the question through this presentation, how could I go about creating a high, high performing, self-managing, profitable and saleable business? And how can I think about managing that transition? And if you are in the business of thinking about succession, which is bringing another generation in, as opposed to maybe business growth or transition or whatever else it may be, um, one of the notions is, uh, and I know it's the case in our business because actually my son is coming through the business at the moment. He's currently the operations manager. He's the CEO in waiting. So what we're doing is we're actually building the value of the business. So when he takes it over, he understands what's going on, but actually the business has grown in size and scale and complexity. And the value of it is in our heads, in our intellectual property, and it's in the systems and processes that we've got in our business and in our client relationships. So those are all the elements of a high-performing, self-managing, saleable, profitable business. So keep that in mind and your notes are there as that's, that's our key aim. So when we're thinking about succession or transition, and I'm being a bit disrespectful here uh, because I've actually been involved and our business has been involved in number one. Um, and it's a very painful process. It's very painful for those people who are in the family or who are in the business where there's just no time to get on and do whatever else needs to be done. And emotions run high and things are very disorderly. And even as the person who's actually managing the process, it's sometimes emotionally quite painful. So I've, I've set in my own mind those other two approaches. So we've actually had some clients who've said, we actually need to go through a transition process in say two years. So what we are doing is we're actually setting up an orderly process so they can cause some change in a couple of years because there are definite reasons. It might be health, it might be a desire to get out of the business, it might be that somebody else wants to come into the business and it needs to happen fairly quickly. Um, the whole thing is though, we want some kind of an orderly process and we want a bit of time up our sleeve. I far prefer option three there, which is what Anthony's going to be talking about and what our whole focus is on, which is that highly proactive sort of an approach for changing the business. That's why we call it business growth and business transition. So I've already explained the idea a little bit of the value of the business because we will actually deal with chunks of the business, which is say the land, the infrastructure, the plant and equipment. Uh, and then you've got the, the attributes of the people and their relationships with the marketplace and all of those sorts of things. They're all of the elements of the business which we'll come to in a minute. So that's why we're back to that mantra of mine down the bottom there. So why would we call it grooming the business? The idea behind grooming the business is we are taking a very proactive approach to what we're doing. So we're actually working out why we're doing what we're doing, so the purpose because that's always, in my perspective, about maximising the value of the businesses I've said. Then it's also about who gets value out of this change process. So it might be 
the people who currently own the business. It might be people who are actually in the business. It might be other family members. It might be investors. It might be the bank. I hate to say it might even be the tax office. These are all the sorts of things, who, people who are potentially beneficiaries of this whole process. Um, if John was standing up the front here and I talked about these key drivers, and this is what we do in some of our programs as well, we'd actually be saying, if you're a customer or a beneficiary or whatever else it may be, it's really important to see into the minds of the people who are involved in this process. Work out what drives them, uh, what motivates them. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we did some work with a, um, an organic horticultural company who was actually focusing on one of the supermarkets as their, as their client. And it had been a very rocky relationship. And so my job was to help them go and talk with the supermarket buyers and so on. And we actually got an understanding of what the supermarket really wanted, which is far, far different from what our clients thought they wanted. So we asked the question. We worked out what their key drivers were. Then we worked out what was unique about what that business was doing, um, how it actually worked, um, and what they could do differently and better to actually sell their product at a higher value, which actually met the needs of the end customer. And how we then unfolded was we actually had a systematic process. And we discovered in that business, which I think had at that time about an $18 million turnover, rarely did they ever have board meetings of the directors. Rarely did they ever agree on the direction of the business. Rarely did they actually have a discussion about what they needed to see happen on the ground. So that's fine for that sort of business, but two of the directors were actually growers themselves. And they actually didn't do any of those sorts of things in their businesses either, which is why things were really untidy behind the scenes. So that's, that's the, kind of, that's the process behind setting up a business for sale. It's taking a very orderly process and it's about making the business owners redundant um, and that might seem strange, but I mean, my objective is to make myself redundant in our business because my desire is to go off and engage with customers that we are developing over in the US. So I need to be able to take that time out of the business and leave the business operate behind me so I can go and do those sorts of things. And what this all requires is a change in thinking in our mindset. And what we're setting out to do today is to try to turn things upside down or, or help you just kind of reframe a bit of thinking. So let's just start with this particular one. This is my little egg diagram that I call, call it. The bit in the yellow um, naturally is the yolk of the egg. So the way I look at it, this is very much a focus on the technical side of doing what we do well, often from a production point of view. And so there's real value in that because the business wouldn't actually happen if you didn't actually have a product. But the question is, if you've got an egg yolk, which just sits on the plate, it just sort of blurts all over the place and then it gets cooked into this kind of untidy sort of a end product. But because it's contained in the shell and it's got the white of the egg, you've actually got a package. So the egg shell, from my perspective, is all about the marketplace. What high value customer out there wants the product uh, that I can produce? Or do I have to produce a product that that customer actually wants? and there's a bit of changed thinking in that whole approach. And so the way I look at life is, it's actually about meeting the customer's needs, finding out what the customer wants, what goes on in the marketplace, and that's in the domestic market, the international market, and then what sits around that is a whole raft of other things. Um, and we'll be talking later about marketing courses and things along those lines, which actually help us think about that sort of stuff. And then we think of the egg, the egg white, there's all sorts of goodies in the egg white and it keeps the market contained with the product and it helps make the world go round in simplistic terms. And the other bit that's down here that's really important, which is why we're here today, is it's the people who are involved in this whole change process. Helping them actually think about doing things differently. Helping them manage the, the, the transition. So, that leads me to our 12 pillars of business best practice, which I just want to put on the table and I'll really quickly run through today. The very first one is about a vision for the people and for the business. And so often we're busy worrying about what's happening with the business. But our objective is to think that the business actually has to work for the owners or the shareholders. Uh, rather than the other way around. So most of us are kind of feel that we've got a tiger by the tail or a juggernaut happening, which is we just have to get off and do stuff. And so our, our thinking is, let's get clear about what, what we're doing, why we're doing it and how we're doing it. So that's what the vision is about. 
Um, products, markets and customers we've pretty much dealt with in simplistic terms. Pillar three is about thinking and acting like a corporate. And you might think, well, look, I'm not the CEO of, a, of Woolworths or NAB or any of those organisations. But potentially, if you look at your business, it might be a million dollar enterprise or a multi-million dollar enterprise. And so it almost deserves the same respect as some of those bigger corporations because the beauty of these smaller operations is they can be nimble. But the thing is, someone's got to have that CEO mindset to actually help drive the business in the direction it needs to go, to engage with the customers in which they need to be engaged with. And don't get me wrong, if I'm the CEO, I actually have to work in the business and work on the business at the same time. But my job, as, I, as we teach some of our, our clients, is right over uh, here I'm a project manager. At this particular time, I might be the chief operating officer or I might be the CFO and it's just about me changing hats and changing thinking. And when we actually engage with some of our clients and they go, well, I just manage the property. Well, that might be so, but that's actually the chief operations officer role. And then I might actually be the joint CEO with my wife or my wife might be the joint CEO with me or the son might be coming up and he might be the chief operating officer, but the CEO in waiting which is kind of happening in our business. So it's a bit of that thinking, then about money, about people. And so I've deliberately put teams, um, staff, contractors, and families, because it's the mechanics of the people. And then it's the systems to allow the people to do their work better. Um, and then it's business risk, legal risk, succession, which we're talking about, value adding and leverage, sales and marketing and communication, quite critical to this whole process. So now I'm going to take you through the five golden rules of a high performing business. Um, and I'm going to, I guess, embed this in a bit of a true story of some of the clients that we're working with at the moment. So I'll set this up this way with our story. Um, uh, the husband or the father, the gentleman, is 62 years of age. He's the fifth generation in that enterprise. Um, it's been a beef and sheep enterprise, so they went from sheep into beef. Um, and his wife is 60. Um, she's an ex-accountant a long, long time ago before kids. And he actually dabbled in law and he dabbled in all sorts of other things. So he's kind of got a bit of a professional background. Um, they've got three kids, um, two girls and a boy. One of the girls has no interest whatsoever in getting involved in the business, but they are very aware that over time she, she, they want to provide for her. They've actually got a daughter who is 21, I believe, who's doing a marketing degree. I've never actually met her, but um, by all accounts, one of my associates has actually met her and she's as smart as a bag full of monkeys. And so potentially she's going to be quite an asset to the business, um, but they don't know quite how that's going to unfold. The son is 29. He's been off and done a nutrition course, and he's got some real insights into the value of beef, um, into particular segments of the market, in the hospitality sector, but also for sick people. Um, and so he's just thinking, what can I do about this business? So that kind of sets that up. Five golden rules, be clear where you're going. Take time out to work on the business, be systematic, be remarkable, uh, and measure success. So why is vision so important? And I know I've had males in the room who say, mate, all this vision stuff, I can't get my mind around it, let's get on and do some of the doing. But they actually had one guy in, in a room who said, you wouldn't believe it, but I'm sitting here and I remember the vision I set for my, myself five years ago and I didn't actually realise that I've achieved the vision that I set out for myself. Um, and those are the sorts of things that are actually quite important, being clear on where the business is going from a business and, and personal perspective. And what it also does is provide that clear target. So it's quite apparent where we're taking the business to. And, and basically we want to get everybody on board so they actually understand the direction. It directs effort, so everyone actually knows they're heading in the right direction. Um, and we can develop processes and procedures around that because how are we going to get to the end game if we don't know what it is? But once we do know what it is, even if it's a bit rubbery because it takes a while for this stuff to unfold, we are actually head heading in a direction in a much more orderly and structured process. Um, I, I wouldn't expect you necessarily to go through this in a great deal of detail, 
but I, we've put it there so you can think about it afterwards. So what does an effective vision look like and feel like? It's something you have to be able to imagine, desire, see that it's feasible. For example, I've had people who say, look, I've got a $50,000 net profit right now. We're going to move to $500,000 net profit next year. You say that's, that's a lovely idea, but it's not achievable. But if we made $50,000 to $75,000 or $65,000, that incremental change is mentally and emotionally feasible. So it's those sorts of concepts. It has to be focused, flexible, and communicable. So for example, I have a young lady who works with us in our PR activities. She says to me, I love working with you, Gordon, because I know where we're going on this journey. Sure, it's about the money, but it's actually the fact that we're on a journey and I love being on the journey with you guys. Okay, so going back, golden rule one, our hypothetical family, it's actually our true family. So what they've decided is that they're gonna set up a five-year plan. The son is actually coming into the business this year and they are actually buying a second property on the assumption that he, on the agreement that he's coming in and on the agreement that they're actually supplying, going to focus on supplying a high value marketplace in the food service and hospitality sector. And they're actually going to still keep their fundamental beef trading operation but they're working towards this high end um, activity. Um, which is going to require a whole changed production system. They're actually actively getting an investor into their business at the, as we speak. Uh, by the end of February, they will have acquired more country as a result of the bank, uh, and they will have actually got an investor on board to help them set up the operations of this new business enterprise. So that's, that's the clarity that they have around where they're going. So work on your business. So I guess I've really described that in the discussion or interchange that Rosemary and I had. So for example, if you come to a workshop like this, you might say, well, I'm actually gonna stop off and have a coffee for two hours on the way back so we can actually make sense of everything that's come out of, of the day. So we won't actually get home until we've got a clear game plan. The idea of working on the business is we actually take a, a professional approach to the business and work out where it's going, how it's going to get there, and how we're going to make it get there. And so we've got a little mantra which is called the most money in the least time with the least effort. And that might sound a bit complicated, but that's actually because we're setting up the intention for how the business is going to look in the future. And if we're looking at this high-performing, self-managing, saleable, highly profitable business, that has to be one of the key things, as does setting an intention and getting clear outcomes. And the bit at the bottom about the big rocks is, it's a bit like I said at the beginning of this presentation, there's so much going on, we just have to decide what are the most important things that we have to deal with straight away, start putting them into our container, deal with them, and keep putting more rocks in and moving on. Okay, so what did our family do? Um, they're actually involved in one of our business development programs, so that was actually working on their business. They actually took time out, the father, the wife and the son to actually create what's called an information memorandum. And by writing 60 pages as it turned out to be, they had to get really clear on all this stuff because they had to convince an investor and the bank that this kind of quite novel plan that they were cooking up would actually have legs. So by working through that whole process, they've not now got real clarity about their business. So that was actually working on their business and deciding where it's gonna go. And so now every three months they come to our program, every month they do a mentoring session. So that's about helping them work on the business and get very clear about it. The whole concept of systems is quite complicated for a lot of people to get their minds around. But effectively we're working on trying to create a systematic business so that you are going to have to get, if you're creating a high performing business, other family members, other personnel, contractors, staff, whatever else it may be, in to help grow the business. Because as the business expands, then the CEO, which I would think potentially all of you in the room are CEOs or aspiring CEOs or whatever it is, you actually need to direct the business and then have other people coming behind. And it's far, far easier if they've got systems to work with. So I'll give you an example. So I work with a, um, another um, family on the Darling Downs 
and I said to the boys, they were in their 20s, fellas, where do you spend all your time? Oh, it's mucking around with machinery. So is that all time well spent? Geez, we wish we could do it much more effectively because we've got a contractor who comes in and does stuff for us. So, so what can we do to speed that process up? We're gonna create a maintenance system. We're gonna create a roadworthy system for the trucks. And so we don't, have to, we don't want to keep on answering the same old questions every year, every season. We just get regular contractors who come in and we say, follow the system. And so that's about making life easy, but it's also about creating value in the business by having it operate in a systematic manner. So you can predict, control and report on what's going on. Because one of our other things that we're coming to is measuring success over time. So if we're having the conversation about marketing, we'd be thinking, we've got all these people in Asia, all these people in Australia, all of these people in the US who just badly want to acquire meat, wool, and our, our other food products. So what they're looking for is something distinct. And so from, a, from I guess, an emotional and mental point of view, if we think that we are special, if well, intrinsically most of us know we're special, but objectively well, we want to be able to explain to somebody else why it is the great product or the great people or the great business is special, it's really important then to be able to describe what it is that makes us unique or special. A unique selling distinction, we call it. Unique selling propositions, what um, John calls it. It means what's unique. In our case, we, we're looking for something that's distinct. Distinguishes us from everybody else who's doing the same sort of thing as what we're doing. Excellence, being creative, having core values. Lisa signed up to the core values in our business and they really appeal to her. And, so, and be prepared to invest in relationships because they are a really critical asset. Um, and going with the flow and telling the story. So our hypothetical family, what are they doing? They've got a story around the son being a nutritionist who actually understands what goes on in the medical and, and illness fraternity. So he's actually creating a special product for those people who are out there. What does the father have that makes him unique? Um, the fact that he's actually got some connections in the hospitality and food service sector in, in a group of RSL clubs, believe it or not. Um, and so they're actually setting up a product to sell to those sorts of people. But what also makes them unique from a production point of view is they've got permanent water. They've just bought another property with permanent water because that was one of their absolute golden rules in their process from here on in to be able to supply product week in, week out, water. So that's actually one of the unique attributes apart from the clean green side of things that they're promoting as well. Golden rule five is be able to measure progress. So when we sit down with our accountant, we think from a compliance point of view, how are we going with our money? But at the same time, we want to be able to measure change in our financials. So most of us are used to doing this sort of stuff, but we're actually suggesting that you think about the customers think about sales conversions, thinking about how to engage with the marketplace, how to engage with our people. And this big one, celebrate success. Human beings, we often default to what's wrong, what's negative. But when you're going through a business change and business transition process, you've actually got to pat yourself on the back. Because there's lots of people who are out there who want to tear you down, but when you're actually moving through an orderly and structured process, you actually want to see yourself in a very positive light. You want to, I guess, engage with like-minded people. But if you're a small team who's actually pushing the envelope, if it's a family or whatever else it may be, you actually need to take time out and actually think, we are not doing such a bad job. As I look back over the last month or two months and look forward to the next two or three months, look at the stuff we've done. Because rarely do we kind of look back and go, geez, we've achieved a lot and then let's just kind of take a big, big deep breath and let's move forward. And so what, what have this family done? Um, we've actually encouraged them to go away for a week to do some planning, but also just to have some time off to go to a favorite place, which just happens to be up the coast. But they're actually going there, not necessarily to have a break, but they're going there to celebrate the stuff that they've done in the last three months of last year because they achieved a great deal and they really pushed the envelope. My take home messages then. 
What I'm proposing is a planned and disciplined approach over the short and long term is absolutely critical if we're thinking about going through this business transition and orderly exercise. It will require brain power and skill and effort and so when you're pushing the envelope you've got to actually understand that it can be a painful process at times. It's about focusing on the value of the business, all aspects of the business and we'll talk a little bit today about divisions of the business and things like that, where is all the value? And then think about where is this business going to in the future? So if it is another generation coming into the business, what sort of business do they want to take on? Um, what might they want to do with the business to grow and develop it over time? If it's an investor, what motivates them to put money into your business? And that's a whole other story, but it's all of those sorts of things, seeing into the minds of the other people who are engaged in the process. And fundamentally, it's about mindset, getting everyone in the business on the same page, which can be really painful, and that's what train wreck successions things are all about. People are often not on the same page, and particularly in families, very painful.